by Designs, and I'm your host, Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Joining us today is Jason Marlia, a naturopath and acupuncturist who specialises in men's health, and that's indeed what we'll be discussing today. Welcome to Wellness by Designs, Jason. How are you? I'm wonderful, uh, Andrew. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you, mate. Um, now, take us through a little bit about your career um, and certainly your interest in men's health. It's not a common speciality that we see. Oh, look, um, I've been a naturopath and integrative health professional for 20, 25 years now. Um, I've studied most uh, major natural medicine modalities, including chiro, osteo, naturopathy, acupuncture, homeopathy, and so forth. Um, but really what led me to the field was injury myself. I was a football player, um, uh-huh. had a pretty severe football injury, which was almost amputated at, at the time, um, and pretty much was put onto a pretty severe course of antibiotics to eradicate the osteomyelitis. And this obviously spiralled me down into a pretty serious state of uh, depression and substance abuse. And so literally I fell into naturopathy by look. Uh, uh, by looking for things to, to heal myself. And uh, I stumbled across nutrition and uh, uh, someone directed me to the College of uh, Australasian College and said, you should go and study nutrition there. And so I went along, had no idea it was a professional training. And uh, three years later, I became a nutritionist and I wondered how I got there because I didn't envisage to be a, a health professional. And then not long after that, um, one of the... Uh, college actually the college dean said to me jason i think you'd be a great naturopath and i just looked at it with this confused look and said what's that didn't even know are they a bunch of leaf eaters or something what are they but no idea so um that's how i ended up a naturopath and in terms of men's health really that was by default obviously being a male being in sports having had wanting to increase my uh, muscle mass and and um, um wanting to better my performance um it's partly to do with that, but also a lot of women would bring in their men and say, look, please look after my man. He's struggling. He's struggling on a number of areas. And, of course, men don't always come in by on their own accord. They get pulled in by the ear and you see, still see the indent mark in their, in their earlobe. Um, so over the years, uh, there's obviously been more of a need for men and also men are coming in now on their own accord, which is wonderful. So. Right. Well, it's good to see that change in focus. Um, tell us more, though, about what sort of conditions you treat. You come from a sporting background and there was yeah. obviously that need for, I mean, not not just um, sporting um, prowess but indeed survival with osteomyelitis and, and you know, you're talking about se- severe disfigurement as a minimum, amputation as a as an expected. Um so what sort of aspects do you like to treat, but what sort of aspects of men's health are presenting more and more? Oh, look, I love to treat um, low testosterone. It's a, a special interest of mine. Um, having, you know, being a man in my 50s, I'm always looking to optimise testosterone for myself, but I also see a lot of young men coming in uh, want to do the same. And uh, But I often get uh, conditions related to, you know, prostate, of course, your general health conditions such as gut problems and, you know, acid reflux, you know, all that kind of stuff. But we uh, typically treat a lot of chronic disease in my clinic. Um, and um, so, you know, your yeah, autoimmune diseases um, and cancer support as well. So, um, but uh, we see a number of male health conditions, um, uh, often related to toxicity, of course. Um, it's a bit of an epidemic. Now, take us through that one. That's really interesting. Toxicity. Um, so you're based in Sydney, right? That's right, yep, in Annandale, yep. Okay. So things like lead, dioxins with regards oh. to the, I remember the Olympic um, Stadium building, there was a whole release of dioxins yep. into the water um, yep. Yep. water table there. Look, I talk about a lot in my in my talks and how I believe Toxicity is the uh, the main cause of most health problems, um, and especially EMF, electromagnetic radiation, which has been shown to have a strong impact on testosterone as well. Um, but toxicity, uh, we see a plethora of different toxins. You know, you've got your phylates, which is you know estrogenic in nature and uh, blocking our testosterone. You've got a lot of um, you know, heavy metals. In fact, myself, I was heavy metal poisoned, and in, in my book, The Wounded Healer, I talk about how 
I slipped into a pretty severe chronic fatigue as a result. So mercury toxicity from dental um, fillings and from um, tap water and what have you. Um, in my case, it was a broken sphygmo, sphygmometer that actually vaporized, which caused my toxicity. But uh, oh. we have, um, yeah, yeah, that was a it was a freak freak thing that happened in the clinic. Just smashed it and it just vaporized and uh, had no idea it was vaporizing at the time. But uh, look, toxicity is um, rampant. We quite commonly do hair analysis and see astronomical levels of mercury, lead, and, and aluminium. Um, we're seeing a lot more titanium these days. I'm not sure if it's because of the titanium implants, but we're seeing a lot more of that. Um, so these are all things that potentially leach our manhood. So things like our zinc gets depleted and what have you, yeah, so... Yeah. Um, what about you know, the old culprits? You know, lead is a cracker. Um, yeah. Uh, um, uh, you've mentioned mercury, but also things like uh, from the workmen, tradies using yes, uh, or working with CCA, yeah, where the, you know, the green yes. timber. Uh, do you still see that or because we've moved away from that onto a more, what are we, are um, we using a I would say type thing now, aren't we? I don't see as much lead as I used to, interestingly, and I think that's since they've removed lead from lead paint. In fact, I was fortunate enough to meet the man who was instrumental in that, um, the late Jason Bowden-Smith, who passed away. He was um, instrumental in getting the lead out of lead paint. And um, But in, since that time, we've seen a quite a decline. I see a lot more mercury and aluminium, actually, um, than anything. But in terms of um, professions, you see a lot of I see a lot of builders in my clinic. In fact, we had a men's retreat recently and they were all builders, and all overweight and all showed signs of toxicity. Um, and it's, it's no, no coincidence then that the building trade is way up there when it comes to the mm -hmm. trades that have the most toxicity, along with hairdressers and, um, um, you know, mining workers. Yeah. Um, so do you find when we're talking about these, as you say, overweight tradies, they're not just toxic, other comorbidities as well. You said they're yeah. overweight, but, um, yeah. you know, do we also see low testosterone in these males or is yes. that a function Absolutely. of other things? Absolutely. Um, I mean, with the toxicity comes a lot of the time nutritional deficiencies. And when you've got nutritional deficiencies, we all know that zinc is an epidemic. Zinc deficiency is an epidemic. And so we see a lot of these deficiencies come along with that. So um, absolutely, you see a lot of deficiencies uh, as well as the toxicity that accompanies that. But you see them a lot of the time come in with, say, high blood pressure. They've been on a medication and that, that blood pressure actually is affecting their manhood. So they're actually not able to um, get an erection. And so they, they come into the clinic. They don't tell me that in the beginning. They'll say, I'm here for my gut. But it turns out that it's actually about mm. their erectile dysfunction. So uh, they... Um, they don't often, you often see it when they fill in their, their reports, or their uh, intake form, they don't actually put why they've come to see me. They'll tell me in the clinic in, in private. That's actually a really good clinical point with men who are having problems with erectile function um, or uh, either attaining or maintaining an erection, look for blood pressure as well. Absolutely, yeah. So if they've been on a medication, you must look and uh, ask them that question. How's, how's things happening in the bedroom? Or, you know, um, and then they'll say to you, oh, as a matter of fact, I've had a bit of a decline in the last three months. And so what happened then? You, they say their medication started. So um, they're often looking for an alternative to the current blood pressure medication they're on because they certainly want us to have a good love life. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. What about you? You were mentioning younger patients, younger men as oh, yes. well. Are you finding that yeah. young in, younger and younger men are having issues with testosterone levels? Yes, absolutely. Um, the research is showing that it's affecting all ages. Um, and since 1987, there's been about a 1% per year in all ages. Um, so that's, if you do the calculations, it's like about 40-odd percent. I mean, some other studies are a little bit more modest in that calculation, but we all agree that we're not the fathers, uh, we're not the uh, the men our fathers were, you know. So, um, so basically, yes, we're seeing a lot of young men, and the interesting thing about young men is they're experimenting with a lot of new medications that have come out, such as SARM, selective androgen receptor modulators, and so it's inconclusive as to what they're doing. We don't exactly know what they do, and so I had a young man in recently, and he showed 
the testosterone levels of an 80 year old and he was in his 20s so my first question was what have you been doing and he said i've been taking psalms so it was non-existent and um so we'd been working with him uh, for some time he was a good looking you know strapping lad full of muscle and i was found it very hard to believe that his his testosterone level was actually that low um, but the interesting thing about young men, they're the ones that are more likely to come in, would you believe? They're, 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 the young men of today, they're a little bit different of the men of yesterday. They're, they're more likely to seek help, especially when something like this mm. is happening. Yeah. Okay. So take us through this, though. This is a really interesting picture. What do yep. you think are the causes? Oh, look, I think there's a lot of substance abuse. I think there's a lot of stress. And I think definitely mobile phones have something to do with it. I mean, if you look at... Mm. They did a study on rats. They found that one hour exposure of EMF per day reduced it by 50%, reduced the testosterone by 50%. So that was a wow. remarkable um, uh, finding. Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, links to vitamin D deficiency. So uh, people who are night workers who don't get morning sun, you see a lot of um, depletion of testosterone as a result of that. Uh, you'll also see um, a lot of young men experiment with diets. So low-carb diets actually cause low testosterone. Um, and the low-carb diet in relation to protein, actually. Um, deficiencies with saturated fat. So, you know, we went on to this, um, this thing of um, reducing all our saturated fats, but in fact, saturated fats actually promotes testosterone. Um, and so there's a number of factors. I think plastics have definitely got something to do with it because you've got about a, you know, they've done a study and they found that about a, a credit card per week that we're ingesting. So imagine that over a year. So I, I, I imagine phylates have a huge impact. And so we see a lot of estrogen dominant men as a result. Um, and so we do a lot of testing and find that uh, quite uh, often. Uh, so, yeah, the the... the, the Causes of testosterone deficiency, I believe, is it's multifactorial, but of course you've got to look at the individual because what's happened in their lifetime obviously has something to do with it, but it's where they started their lifetime and their genetics. So as you know, genetics plays about 20% of the role and your exposome plays about 80% of the role in what, what a person presents with in the clinic. So in my clinic, we go, it's about the why versus what continuum. So they've come here, they've got the what going on, so we want to understand the why. So the why is what they started the world with, with their genetics, plus their exposome gives you what's happening today. And that's uh, a model that I work with to demonstrate to the patient and how we work and also to get it clear in their heads how, how it's going to unfold. Um, yeah. But, um, but yeah, the genetics has a lot to do with it. So SNPs, polymorphisms have a lot to do with it. So they have issues with estrogen clearance. You've got phase one, phase two, uh, detox issues um, and conversion. Um, uh, you've got SNPs that relate to easier conversion to that potent DHT, which um, uh, can obviously lead to prostate issues and what have you. Um, so you've got to look at the genetics. I think in those difficult cases, you've really got to understand their, uh, their gene profile. Yeah. So when you're talking about assessments, are, the, are there standard ones that you always do or very often do, like you're talking gene, genetics? Um, if you're yeah. talking about toxicity, you might look at a hair mineral tissue analysis. Yeah. What about gut function, things like that? Tell, take oh, yeah. us through your intake yeah. and your assessments. Oh, look, when we see the patient for the first time, of course we want to you know, we want to give them the best bang for their buck. So we want to know what's the test that's going to give us the most information and help us mm. to get the most clinical information to help them get to their goal faster. So gut microbiome, we do a lot of testing. Um, I, I think I'm probably the highest uh, f uh, for the microbial, microbial one that um, um, Metagenics released um, some time ago. I think I prescribed so many of those. I think I'd have to be a top on the list. But um, then, of course, uh, you've got to look at, I do a preliminary health screening in my clinic. We use a, a, a scan, and that gives us an idea of how they're functioning. So we use a, a bioimpedance scan along with an interstitial scan, which gives us an idea of their organs. And then from there, it's like a triage nurse. We direct the patient to the right testing uh, protocol. So heavy metals comes into it. Of course, hormones, salivary hormone profiles for men. Um, and the interesting thing about men, that's a little bit different to women in the way they, um, what they expect. They want you to test. 
they really want data and they want evidence. Yeah. So, yep. you know, they often come to me and they say to me, I heard you do a lot of testing. And so, yes, we do. We're very big on testing. Um, and, um, yeah, so that would probably be some of the standard ones we run. And, of course, for the more um, serious conditions, we run other screenings, um, you know, for cancer, what have you. We run the, a lot of the RGCC oncogenomics tests. Um for tissue specific, uh, so for uh, cell line specific uh, extracts treatments, yeah. So, right. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's it's hard to sort of. Um, I've I've got to think about asking a patient group question because you deal with these different groups. So, it I can't ask a broad question. It's kind of yeah, yeah. quite quite interesting. Yeah. So, let's say uh, if we go back to young men. We're talking about yeah. testing, looking at heavy metals, looking at pesticide residues, phthalates, things like that, um, and also stress. I'm imagining that they wouldn't be at least yet the age group, maybe they would be, um, that are on statins, which has been no. a confounding issue for testosterone. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Yep. Any medications that are rearing their heads? You mentioned substance abuse. Anything that we've got to be aware of to ask our patients about? Antidepressants. So if you look at antidepressants, antidepressants can affect um, a number of things, of course. They can affect our I – mean, they one of the number one uh, side effects is weight gain, right? Um, but yep. so why does it cause weight gain? It affects the liver, right? And most medications in general, they have some kind of effect on the liver. They put more mm -hmm. load on the liver. So – if we, if we have a patient standing in front of us who's got poor phase one or phase two detoxification pathways, automatically any medication, but often an antidepressant, will um, slow their detox of estrogens um, and therefore create estrogen dominance. So you've got to look at, um, you look at the drugs specifically, but I think drugs in general as well. Um, but other medications, I would say uh, for the young groups, I mean, they're, they're partying a lot, right? And they're using amphetamines mm. and they're using uh, drugs that are stimulating cortisol. And, and of course, they, they end up in a sympathetic nervous system dominant state, which then pushes their uh, production to cortisol rather than testosterone. So you get a shift from making testosterone to cortisol. Um, mm. So you've got those kind of things. Um, and I think in young people, the thing that I see quite commonly is they're overtraining. They're overdoing it, so that's also affecting their uh, cortisol levels, it's affecting sleep. Yeah, um, I had a young man just the other day. He was only sixteen years of old, uh, sixteen years of age. He had terrible sleep, um, and we it was affecting his energy levels. All the things related to low testosterone. But I should point out that mm. would you believe low human growth hormone is quite as uh, it's a bit of an unsung uh, hero in terms of not unsung hero, but. Uh, a bit of a hidden um, issue. cause of some of the symptoms because the actual the symptoms are the same as low testosterone as well. So you'll get a patient sometimes will say, my doctor says my testosterone is normal, and I've um, but I've got all the symptoms of low testosterone. Can you check me out? So I check them out. I do a salivary hormone profile, and yes, it's normal. So then you've got to expect uh, HGH, right? So, um, and yep. then if you really look at the picture, you'll find often they got lack of sleep, which then affects their human growth growth hormone production because it's initiated in the first half to an hour of sleep uh, with uh, the right levels of GABA. So that's where the microbiome comes in because we often see high GABA consumption in the gut, um, which is affecting their sleep. And then when you, you know, <laughs> bodybuilders talk about it all the time. You must sleep and you must eat. And they got it right. You know, you have to sleep well and you have to eat well if you want to build muscle mass. So, yeah, so that kind of thing. We see that kind of thing quite regularly. Um, so GABA is a wonderful treatment, I find, for those people that are constantly stressed, not switching off, not able to recover well, you know, got the symptoms of low test, but actually um, it's actually not low test. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. But such one would say, oh, such a simple answer for low lowered yeah. growth hormone production. Mm, not that easy to achieve, particularly in those men in their young and silly days, out partying or exactly. things like that. 
Not that yeah. I ever did that. Um, so <laughs> let's go into some of the other things that you that you use <laughs> in clinic. Um, I, yeah. I, like it, it's a question that I ask because it's easy, but I get yeah. that every patient's different. I understand. But yes, um, something about let's say more common nutrients yeah. and, and um, therapies that you might employ. Oh, look, I mean, number one on the list, you, you, we mentioned it before, zinc. You know, um, you know, I, I think the world, the study they've done on uh, worldwide, they showed that 25% of people were deficient in zinc. And it was also depending on socioeconomic situ, uh, situation. However, in my clinic, I would say it's more close to 80 to 90% when it comes to male health, zinc deficiency. So I'm very big on zinc supplementation, zinc sulfate and zinc bisglycinate. Um, of course, we've got to watch how much we give because it can upset the gut. And, um, you know, um, but, you know, typically about 50 to 100 milligrams of zinc. So zinc's usually top on the list. Uh, of course, you've got, um, depending on the condition, of course, are we talking about low test? I mean, in terms of young men, um, we often use, you know, uh, estrogen blockers, would you believe, more often than test boosters and, Look, um, DIM's out there and so is indole through carbonyl and, the, the, you know, the community split in terms of which one to use. I mean, DIM, of course, is the byproduct of um, the breakdown of indole through carbonyl, but there's not enough data to really uh, tell us what it actually really does. Um, indole through carbonyl is a lot more uh, backed in research um, and it's showing that it can, um, you know, block estrogen. Um, so that's a... One I use, indole three carbonyl, uh, especially for estrogen dominance, ma male and female. Um, we typically what, what use about, a lot of what about yes. sulforaphane in that in that regard? Yeah, look, I was using that a while ago. I didn't see the significant changes that I liked with uh, estrogen in men. Um, okay, because I always retest. Of course, we always retest. Yep. Um, and um, I just find indole 3 carbonyl. I'm just more comfortable with that one, comfortable with more of the data there and um, uh, it's just a bit of a bugger that doesn't come in capsules. It's only in a powder form. But, um, mm. but uh, yeah, uh, boron's another one that's an unsung hero. That's a mm. very good one for blocking estrogen. A lot of people right. um, don't routinely get boron checked, but I do have a machine, mm. a resonance machine, that actually can detect if boron is low. Um, we use um, your standard stuff that, for, that that crosses over to women as well. You know, a lot of gut support. You know, supplements. Actually, a product that I a, a lot of men come in with a lot of acid reflux. You know, um, I'm not sure whether it's because they eat a lot of pies and beers, but um, it's predominantly men that come in. I find with, and especially the distended men. Um, and there's a great product that I use. It contains zinc carnosine and some mastic gum and licorice in there, and it's a wonderful product, especially if it's, that's gastro, um, that acid reflux has led to, say, gastritis. It's a wonderful product. Um, so, uh, But in terms of test production, there's there was a systematic review done on all the herbal extracts, and surprisingly what came up the top was fenugreek. Fenugreek right. really shone really well in terms of lifting testosterone, shortly followed by um, Tongat uh, Ali, which... Um, Tongat, yeah, Tongat Ali, yeah. yeah. Tongat yeah. Ali, I can never pronounce it. But um, I've used that myself. The only thing with that one is you've got to watch men or people with uh, anxiety and sleep issues because it can actually stimulate, oh. uh, be a bit stimulatory and create some anxiety. Um, <clears throat> the community split um, on tribulus. Whilst tribulus is great for, um, you know, erectile dysfunction, it's not great for testosterone production. There's mixed mixed evidence. It sort of goes, and I find that myself. I mean, um, you try it in certain men and they just, they make sure they never run out. They always want to get a backup. And then you've got the other type. Yep. They go, nah, didn't do anything. So it's about 50-50 with tribulus. So, gotcha. um Tribulus is, is still used quite extensively and, um, you know, we use, of course, some of the traditional Chinese medicine uh, formulas, Panax ginseng. Um, there was a wonderful formula that contained um, Panax ginseng with licorice and some some buplerum, um, which unfortunately got discontinued. It's still available as a Chinese medicine um, formula. 
But that product mm. was well rounded because panic ginseng by itself isn't that effective for testosterone, but in combination with other mm. herbs, it works a dream. Um, it's obviously that naturopathic synergistic approach uh, and that Chinese medicine formulation that's um, uh, winning there. So, yeah. Um, so, Tonkat Ali has been registered, I think it's from mid-2022, on the yes. um, Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods, even though there's no company yet that's brought a product out. Um, what about other herbs? That, they're not approved yet um, by yeah. the TGA, but things like um, Fagodia Agresta and um, yeah. Chilijit. Mm-hmm. Chilijit, yeah, look, I do use that? Chilijit. Yeah, I do use it. That's highly nutritive. So that's um, has got some evidence behind it. Um, the the one that a lot of people are using, a lot of young men are using, is turkesterone, the the insect oh, yes. steroid, the, the one that yes, um, that's insect unfortunately plant, not. Right? Um, yes, insect plant. Uh, sort of the structure is very similar to testosterone. Um, yeah. I've used it myself, and I find it does work. I, it does give, uh, but I find that like a lot of the tea lifters, once the levels have increased, they stop working. Um, so Tongart's like that as well. So once it gets you to a healthy testosterone level, it doesn't take you over. It keeps you in that threshold and it pretty much stops working. So cycling is a good idea. Um, but but isn't isn't that what we want to achieve though? I mean, isn't that one of the beauties of herbs that if it's high, yes. it'll bring it low, lower it. If it's yes. low, it'll bring it up to normal, but it won't overdo things. We we found yes. this with, for instance, ginseng years ago. You know, with blood pressure, low blood pressure, you can use Korean ginseng to yep. normalize it up. High blood pressure, just using a small amount of ginseng, you can bring it down, but don't go overboard yep. like the ginseng abuse syndrome that was noted yep. by these bodybuilders and things like that. Um, Absolutely. So yeah. can I can I ask then? So when you're using these, I mean, let's say testosterone supportive herbs, um, all of which we've spoken about there, do you look at doing the pretest for their testosterone, possibly their estrogen metabolites, and a post test so that you're making Absolutely. sure that nothing's going awry? Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. And. Um, I mean, just 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 the other day, we had a gentleman. He said I was doing great on the formula he gave me, but I've just plateaued, and so that's a sign that you've got to change things up a little bit, of course. Yeah. Um, but yeah. so we're now doing our follow-up screen to see if it's had an effect, and if it's had an effect and it's increased it, then why is the person still feeling deficient? So there might be some other component to his health that's affecting him. So. Um, so, yeah, absolutely, I'm a big fan of testing and retesting because you you want to see. Mm. I, I mean, I'm a person who loves clinical evidence. I don't so so much get hooked into the scientific evidence per se only because um, the interesting thing about a lot of the studies is they don't really um, specify who they're testing. So, for instance, with, um, you know, individuals they don't say that the person's got this polymorphism and this person doesn't have this polymorphism or this yeah. person has this blood type and this so it's um uh i asked a, a scientist recently do they ever factor in blood type when they do their science and they said absolutely not they said she said but we should because there's such a vast difference in the blood groups and what they how they respond so yeah absolutely we re- always test and retest i'm a big fan of that there's there's a uh it's one of those uh, horrible things that any researcher has to face, and that is how much money do, have they got to throw at the yeah. the research that they're doing. The other thing, of course, is that um, you'll get the answers to the questions that you ask. And I've seen, yeah. you know, for instance, uh, you know, vitamin D doesn't work in cardiovascular disease. So, so how long did you give it for? A year. Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> how much did you exactly. give? 400 IU. <laughs> Right. So, yes, so yes. you often get the, the answers to the questions that you ask. Um, yep. So I totally take your point that it, re- it requires a, a dedicated expertise, expert clinician to sort of uh, interpret research and put it into the, the clinical field. Absolutely. Um, Jason, you do a lot of retreats and things like that, I understand as well, right? Take yeah, us we'll go, through. We'll... Yeah, take us through that. 
Look, uh, men's retreats that I do have just started. I just finished my first one here in the Blue Mountains because I live in the Blue Mountains now. Um, yeah. And I thought it would be a great opportunity while I live up here to start retreats and I thought to myself, who really needs it? And then uh, the next person that walked in my door, my clinic, I think it was a very stressed out male and I thought to myself, it's the men. Um, mm. And so... It became very popular amongst the women. Of course, I mentioned it to the to the women, and women were like, "Oh, please take my man." So um, we we run these uh, uh, retreats now, where we address what's known as the man code. And so there's eight components that I've identified that affects people's uh, men's health, well being, mental health, and uh, life of purpose. And uh, interesting, we've mentioned a few of them already. So these are things like toxicity, stress, a poor mindset, a lack of connection to a purpose. I mean, they've got a money full of a pocket full of money, but they're not happy in their jobs. Um, things like, um, you know, poor diet, um, overweight. Um, but there are eight components that we address individually. And by the mm. time the men leave the retreat, they've got a, a toolkit, just like they have at their jobs. Um, on how to look after their health and live a purposeful life. So that was a very successful event. I was very happy with it. So the boys have already signed up for next year. So um, I, I imagine it will grow. Yeah. Well, yeah, but it, it, like it's really good. We we often see and hear of women's groups um, going on retreat and it's accepted, but it's not very well accepted, if you like, that men go on retreats. And yet, it's so well, important because the... I feel that I feel yeah. that um, in our culture, we've lost this. You use the word correctly: connection, purpose. We've lost that connection to purpose. Absolutely, and you knocked it on the head. I mean, it's um, in the old days. You mentioned retreat; it's a very feminine thing. It's a very female thing, you know. But with men. Um, I think they're coming, coming, slowly coming on board with these kind of um, ideas that it's not such a feminine mm -hmm. thing. So mm -hmm. it's about your marketing, and I think it's who's pitching it as well. So if I was like, um, you know, a female yogi promoting it, it might not attract a male. But being a, mm -hmm. a male myself, and um, you know, into exercise and training, so it, it attracts other men of course so if it's okay for you then it's okay for me so so yeah it's i think it's with men it's it's how you uh pitch it to them so mm. but slow uh but when they came it was interesting with the rinse retreat they you saw some of them were like a bit unsure what was going to happen but when they got involved it they they got stuck into it and it was like amazing oh, so um and uh, and these are just your normal burly cool. blokes who have a meat pie at the pub and these are your normal guys not 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 guys who really had much to do with natural health, or um, hmm. so that was a um, a nice little. Um, I, I gotta say, outcome. that's that's a real well done for you because it's it's very common that these let's call them the blokey blokes, right? It's very common yeah. that the blokey blokes are left to their own devices. That you know they're the ones that aren't very demonstrative in normal circles. They're not not um, uh, emotionally out there if you like and yet it requires somebody like yourself to say mate this is something you need we all need to do this together it's a real interesting thing about connection um yeah very well done absolutely thank you andrew i was just gonna say the um i forgot what i was gonna say now um it was in relation to the supplements actually if you have a look at the supplements even the supplements are all geared for women you see a lot of women's formulas out there. How many companies, mm. if you really look at it, how many companies have a good male health formula? Um, I mean, you've got mm. the multivitamins, men's multivitamins, but there seems to be a lot more emphasis on the research and putting together female formulas, PMT formulas and menopause formulas. Um, so I've been telling uh, some of the, uh, the supplement companies, we really need some for reformulations um, to happen because a lot of the men are left to their own devices and they pretty much listen to Andrew Huberman or they listen to some of these guys online, um, which can be beneficial but uh, not specific enough. 
And I had a young man who took, you mentioned Fidozia, took a, her, a young man came into my clinic who'd been taking Fidozia, developed a kidney disorder as a result of taking Fidozia. Right. So, I mean, these <clears throat> these are the kind of things we're seeing. And um, so, I mean, this guy's huge, this Andrew Huberman. I like him myself. He's great what he's done, mm. great what he does. He's got great research. But unfortunately, it's not targeted to the individual. So I think men need mm. a bit more individualised support. We actually need the supplement industry to actually support them as well. Um, and mostly local um, supplement industry, industries I'm talking about because there's plenty overseas. Um, so, yeah. Mm. Um, Jason, where can we find out more? You've done your first retreat. We're looking forward to more of that. Any other stuff that you do to support men? Oh, look, at the moment it's, it's, it's pretty much the, uh, the retreats, but, I mean, if, uh, uh, if men wanted to get on board a men's health program, you can go to my website. There's a lot of information about a men's health program there. Um, we, we, tell them the, it, we talk about the process and how it all um, works, um, collect the data, do the testing um, and so forth. Uh, but, uh, yeah, look, uh, they're your main avenues. Jason, you've just run your first retreat. We're looking forward to more. That's fantastic. What other resources have you got to help men out? Oh, look, I've got a book called The Wounded Healer, which I wrote uh, a few years back. And in that book, it gives a lot of the components that we actually talk about at the uh, the Man Code retreats that we run. Um, so in that book, uh, there's a wellness program. So that book also tells you where I come from and how I got into this field and um talks a lot about the mindset so um, it's a great add-on uh, for a lot of people in general in my clinic to understand um, more the um, the mindset side of things rather than just the health side of things so it's about helping people to not only you know connect uh, to get their health right to get a bit more clarity in their life to connect to a purpose which makes them live a happier life I guess well done Jason Jason Thank you so much for taking us through this. Very important topic, very often overlooked. And and let's face it, men aren't usually the demographic that is seen in clinic. Um, and I think we're very lucky to have somebody like yourself with your history and certainly your dedication to men's health out there. Well done. Thanks so much, Andrew, and it's been a pleasure joining you today. So, yeah, look forward to um, uh, doing more of this kind of work. It's, it's quite a passion and... Uh, something I love to do every day and I'm quite blessed to wake up and uh, do this kind of work. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We'll have all of the show notes. We'll have as much information as we can up in the show notes. And, of course, there's the other podcasts on the Designs for Health website. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. This is Wellness by Designs. 